Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for the possibility to give this presentation here on the public dangers of dangerous brains, as I called it. And the very broad question that is very important for my research is the question, a theoretical question, what makes psychology special such that it cannot and will not be replaced by neuroscience? But it would take me a bit more time and maybe it wouldn't be a very TED-like talk if I would talk about this question, but I did a couple of years ago at the opening ceremony of our academic year, maybe some of you remember. But there are some colleagues, for example here, Victor Lama from the University of Amsterdam, who actually make this claim, who say, get rid of psychology, which was actually his welcome present when he was appointed professor in 2004 at the University of Amsterdam in the psychological department that he called his inauguration talk, Weg mit der Psychologie, get rid of psychology. But I will talk about a, a practical variant of this question and when I say practical, I don't only mean the society, but also applied research, and particularly in the forensic sciences. So the question I will talk about today is, what are the prospects and implications of identifying dangerous people by looking for dangerous brains? We wear of the brain, so to speak. So there's a common account within biological criminology, recent biological criminology, that you have maybe same, uh, safe brains, brains that are without an visible or, or measurable uh, abnormality. I hope this is really a safe brain because this is a middle slice throughout my own brain. <laughs> but there are common accounts, and I'm sure many of you know them. It's standard textbook knowledge. For example, Phineas Gage, who had this uh, iron bar shot through his uh, brain, frontal cortex. A famous patient of Antonio Damasio's, uh, Elliot, he is called, who had very similar uh, brain damage. And more recently, for example, Mr. Oft, as he has been called in the English literature, Oft for uh, orbitofrontal tumor, who really had a very huge, I think it's very th clearly visible also for people who are not used to looking at uh, brain images, uh, that he had really a very huge tumor in his orbitofrontal cortex. And the common account is often to label these patients, these people, for example, as acquired sociopaths or as pseudo-psychopaths. Uh, so they are compared to a group of people who so actually are very dangerous for society and criminal brains, dangerous brains, are really uh, labels that you find in the literature and the way people are talking about that. But then there are less famous accounts, something that I could call an anomaly as a philosopher of science, that you would see, for example, here a patient from uh, Spain who actually suffered brain damage in a very similar way to, uh, to Phineas Gage 150 years earlier, in very similar kind of brain damage, but who was never in his life psychiatrically salient. And the neurologists who, who investigated him because of epileptic fits said that one of the most salient features about his personality was that he was talking the same jokes over and over again. But of course, many of us do so without being dangerous people. So reading these accounts prompted me to ask myself, actually, what kind of evidence or how good is the evidence actually that we have for the standard accounts, placing those three, and there are many more examples like these three, in the dangerous brains category. And I proposed a revised account, so with respect to Phineas Gage, I wasn't the first one, but I think I was one of the first, at least with the newer cases, that actually you can see that these cases, that there's not really good evidence, or maybe not even any evidence at all, that would indicate that these patients had been criminal, maybe not even have been immoral. Of course, they had social uh, decision-making impairments, um, and the the newest one, uh, Mr. Oft, is a bit um, um, an exception here because he, that's uh, legally proven, so to speak, he collected illegal pornography and he also approached his stepdaughter inappropriately, so he didn't rape her, but it was illegal what he did. But the interesting case here is now, he's very often uh, reported as a case of pedophilia caused by a brain tumor, so there's an operation has been performed. But what the people um, neglect who are interpreting this case, or the majority of opinion neglects is, that of course this whole brain area has been resected, so it has been removed from the brain. So you could just as well argue that after it has been removed, how could he behave morally if the orbital frontal cortex is actually in the necessary brain structure for moral behavior? So you, he, you could place him in both categories. So the result of my theoretical historical analysis, and actually the question mark already gives away that I, my conclusion, I don't think they are dangerous brains, but the same more uh, sophisticated conclusion of my analysis is twofold. So what has happened actually is there was a selective reinterpretation of evidence that makes brain information appear more decisive than it actually is. In particular, Damasio in the late 1990s, 
was one of those who did that. And many others uh, copied maybe from Damasio without reading the original papers. Uh, and then secondly, the effect of the social environment as independent variable actually has been neglected by many neuroscientists and neurologists. And we could ask ourselves, why is that the case? Maybe because they don't know the methods, maybe because they don't have learned to look at people through the social lens, as maybe psychologists do it. And this is also nicely related to the talk earlier by Saskia uh, Kuhnen, because she emphasized that context and development are important in understanding these trajectories of individual persons. And context and uh, development is certainly something that has been forgotten in many of these common accounts of dangerous brains. So my second and last part says a bit, uh, what should we make out of that? Or what is happening with these ideas now in the present academic discourse? And whom I have quoted here is uh, Adrian Rain, a very influential and successful um, biological criminologist in the United States at the University of Pennsylvania. He's just also um, published a review paper with some co-authors in Nature versus Neuroscience recently, where he doesn't take this stance, but in his monograph, about 500 pages about the history, the present and the future of biological criminology, he maybe expresses his own thoughts a bit more openly. And there he says, for example, criminals do have broken brains, brains that are physically different from those of the rest of us. The difference are substantial and can no longer be ignored. And in a bit in a similar way, in Victor Lama, a few years ago in his book on, the, on free will, he said that actually every brain, he says, that commits a misdeed uh, in a way is uh, riots incorrectly, the sit well and laws, as he put it in Dutch. And Rain, as I said, he's not only summarizing the past and the present, but he's also looking into the future. He's thinking uh, about what the next developments could be. And while he admits that this is specul speculative, what he describes here, he also says that he thinks about, about 20 to 30 years, the science will be ready for this program that I will show you a few facts about in a few minutes. Um, and he thinks actually it is likely that this is going to happen. And this program is called Legal Offense on Murder, Brain Research Operation for the Screening of Offenders, or also abbreviated Lombroso. So it's, a, it's a bit also meant as a rehabilitation of the famous 19th century biological criminologist from Italy, Lombroso, Cesare Lombroso. And what is his, what is his perspective on this? What is his vision? So in 2033, a mandatory program, this Lombroso program, will be enacted and this will imply the genetic and brain screening of all adult men. And those subjects who are, uh, are identified as LP, v, LPS or LPH positive, LP always means Lombroso positive, and V for, stands for violence, S for sexual offense, and H for homicide. So all those subjects identified as LP people, they will be put into unlimited preventive detention. 2033. 2039, this program is um, extended to include pe uh, children aged 10 years of older in the so-called National Child Screening Program. And those children who are identified as LP children, or the parents of them, they will off they'll be offered a voluntary residential two-year treatment, so, but they, that means that they will be taken away from the family uh, for two years, and that would cut the risk of them to become criminals uh, into half. But only three year to, uh, years later, actually, the treatment becomes mandatory, so it will not, no longer be a voluntary choice for the parents. And then finally, in 2049, a parental licensing act is passed, and this would imply that people who decide to become parents uh, first need to get a license from the government or from the authorities. And of course, they have to prove that they will be capable parents of their children to prevent that they become dangerous people, for example. So and let me really emphasize that uh, Rain doesn't mean this as a joke. So he, really, he concedes it's a speculation. Of course, he cannot predict the future. But he even thinks that the essence of this program, Lombroso, is already enacted in the criminal system in the United States, he says explicitly, or Great Britain, where he comes from originally, um, or also China and Singapore. So he thinks this is likely. And he thinks that the science at that time is very likely to be ready to allow these predictions. So I, I won't read out this quote, but I would like to remind here that uh, in this debate on criminology, uh, some colleagues, some scientists very often make the case that the present criminal system that we have, the way we treat criminals, punishing them, finding them guilty, locking them away, actually is very inhumane, they say. And they presume that if we had a scientific um, system, 
where we get rid of the notion of responsibility, where we get rid of the notion of punishment, of guilt, uh, that such a system would be much more humane. And very recently, uh, Abigail Marsh, she's an effective neuroscientist from the University, University of Georgetown, uh, responded to the Edge Org 2014 question, what scientific idea is ready for retirement, by saying, actually, the distinction between crime and mental disorder. And she argues in favor of this on the basis of psychological research by saying that uh, using psychological tests, those two groups, she says, criminals and mental patients, they are very much alike. So it is arbitrary and unjustified to draw a normative distinction between them. This is what she um, proposes here in this edge answer she's given. So let me conclude. First of all, I hope this has become clear. I mean, of course, I've I only talked briefly about some clinical uh, cases here, individual cases. There are also correlational studies, uh, fMRI studies, you name it, whatever kind of studies. Um, but they are, uh, I think it's fair to say that they are very um, equivocal, so there's no clear view. Actually, at uh, Felix Schirmann's poster, you can see that already in the history there were other theories where they emphasized uh, the parietal lobes or even the cerebellum, so now it's the orbital medial uh, cortex. Um, so I think it's fair to say, at least at the present time, there are no dangerous brains. And how humane scientific treatment versus criminal punishment is crucially depends on risks of stigmatization and false positives. And Rain even concedes that there will be many false positives in his uh, model, people who will be put into preventive detention, although they never would have committed a crime if they had not been put into the system, as well as life conditions and the chances for rehabilitations, for example, in prison. And I would like to re remind you that science-based treatment programs of offenders actually led, in some cases, to civil rights catastrophes in the past so if, for example, the uh, Afro-American civil, civil rights movement of the United States in the 50s and the 60s actually was psychiatrized very much and the medical historian Jonathan Metzl even called this um, the protest psychosis and he shows how schizophrenia became a black disease at this time that freedom fighters, civil rights fighters in the United States, Afro-Americans fought for the right uh, for equal treatment and many of them were uh, diagnosed as schizophrenics. And uh, finally, the penal law actually protects civil rights, and this is, I think, a normative aspect that some colleagues tend to forget who are talking about criminology. Penal law is actually a measure, an instrument to protect our civil rights, in particular in those cases where we have doubts about somebody's guilt or not. So I hope implicitly it has become clear how the practical case that I discussed today is related to this big question. What makes psychology special such that it cannot be and will not be replaced by neuroscience? If you have your own answer, please send me an email. I'm very interested to find out about this. And with this, I would like to mention some of my collaborators also. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>